Welcome. Good morning. I'm Roseanne Hansen, and this is Cartography 101 with my Field Arts Institute. And thank you so much for, for signing up. I have been having so much fun getting ready for this workshop. And I'll be introducing myself in just a few moments, but let me do some housekeeping real quick. First of all, if you don't mind, um, everybody, if you could turn off your videos and make sure you're muted, please. The reason I ask you to turn off your videos right now is that really helps me with the recording quality on Zoom. I get a much higher recording. Also, this morning, I told some of you already, uh, my primary computer uh, hard drive went down this morning. I spent two hours trying to recover it. It died it's dead. So I'm using a backup computer. It's not quite as robust. So I'm hoping the technology will work well and we have a good smooth run. And if it, it doesn't, then, then I'll we'll carry on and I'll do this again. But just warning you that um, I'm not using, hi Polly, I'm not using my full on um, big iMac. So uh Polly, if you could turn off your video, we were asking folks to turn off their video during the, the presentations. And when I come back for Q&A, we can turn them back on, but that's to help me with the bandwidth. If you have questions during the uh, program, do put them in the chat. I am without a, an assistant today, so I won't be able to um, respond to the chat during any time I'm giving a, you know, a slideshow, or, or playing a video. So I'll try to check back in and, and check on that so that it, um, it works. And also, um, if at any point my sound goes off or something's just not right, please come on verbally and go ahead and interrupt me and say, hey, Roseanne, we can't hear you, <laughs> or, you know, focus is off or whatever. Um, so and I will periodically come in and ask people to uh, turn off their videos so that we can keep that bandwidth down. We're gonna have a lot of people joining us today. All right, so that said, let me um, sort of give you a, an idea of how, what we're going to be doing today and then we'll get right started. Uh, so our goal today is to delve into the art and even a little bit of the history of cartography of maps. And we're going to look at four different ways to represent spatial and nature data in your field notebooks. And I just wanna emphasize, this is not, um, this is for journals, think, to put maps in our journals, our field notes for scientists. This is not technical mapping with theodolites and, and um, laser measuring devices. Uh, we are not doing exact maps, but we're going to explore different ways um, to get nice looking maps and maps that represent what we're seeing, uh, both landscape and uh, wildlife, wildlife data, or perhaps um, uh, other, other things that we'll, we'll look at, um, not to give too much away. And then to practice, yes, we are going to do draw four maps, uh, maybe not complete them all, but we'll get them started. Uh, and we're going to do so by visiting the Serengeti of America. That is Yellowstone National Park. And we'll go to one place and draw that place four different ways, visualize it four different ways, which is going to be fun. Now, if you didn't get my, um, my uh, PDF links, let me put that in the chat. Hold on here. These, these are the same document that I'm doing here. Um, all right, check your chat. If you're on an iPad, you will not be able to probably download them, but these will also be on the web page that I create. Uh, that you'll you'll get the recording and all this information. So those are just cartographic elements and features. I emailed that earlier as well. So, all right. So I will be giving a, a slideshow and then I will be uh, sharing a video to set the stage for uh, 
the, the Serengeti of America. And then we'll come back and I'll take you there using this really cool Google uh, 360 degree views. And then we'll start sketching. So if there are no doubts, questions, anything um, doesn't look like it, then I'm going to get started with the uh, slideshow to talk about maps. Right, I'm Roseanne Hansen. And a little bit about my background. I'm the art and science program coordinator at the University of Arizona's Desert Laboratory on Tumamoc Hill. And my own business is the Field Arts Institute at my husband and I's uh, exploringoverland.com. We are naturalists, explorers, artists, photographers, writers. I've been working in the field um, and keeping field journals for over 35 years. And I'm totally self-taught when it comes to the sketching part. And I, I just absolutely love to help people explore the world through words, art, and science. And as someone mentioned earlier, they noticed I've got a new project. It's a new book called Master of Field Arts, in which I take you on a guided journey from nature journaler to a master of the field arts, including cartography and so much more. So we'll be debuting that hopefully this summer. All right, what is cartography? Interestingly, it is from the Greek, uh, which means papyrus or sheet of paper and graphen write. And it is the study and practice and making and using maps, combining science aesthetics and technique it builds on the premise that reality or an imagined reality can be modeled in ways that communicate spatial, and I will insert uh, nature information effectively. So humans have been making maps for a very long time. This is a Stone Age map. It is thought to be a Stone Age map at Twyfelfontein in Namibia. And it is about 6,000 years before present in what is known as the Wilton culture group. And that's when they, they believe most of the markings on this very large boulder. They think that the circles are a correspond to known springs or water in a desert environment. And there are various animals around on the map. And so, well, if it is a map, but that's what we're, we're thinking this was. Really fascinating. So we've been trying to depict our environment in a more permanent way on rock, on paper, we'll see, uh, for a very long time. This is a Babylonian map, approximately 700 to 500 um, before the current era. It's, mess, it's depicting Babylonia, and that is at the center. And, and we'll see this theme in a couple other maps, but the ocean is, is depicted by a circle and the known world is within that circle, interestingly. Then fast forward a little bit. In the second century, Ptolemy, uh, Ro uh, a Roman, he was born in Alexandria, an astronomer and astrologer, which is interesting, he mapped the known solar system and then he derived a system of latitude and longitude to map the earth. It was the first time. And that is an incredibly compelling uh, map there. That is a manuscript copy of his map, but it's fascinating that he was starting to figure things out that early. And a little um, trivia here, he, he figured it out because he was a dedicated astrologer and he wanted to map exactly where everybody was born, which would tell him much more about their astrological um, information and sign because it was a geographical thing. So you can, um, you can thank Ptolemy for founding geography uh, because of astrology, which is pretty funny. Um, however, all of that science was pretty much lost during the dark ages. A thousand years went by before we started to get back to some semblance of science uh, related to the art of mapping. 
So in the seventh century Europe, uh, the Orbis Terrarum was, as you can see, looks a lot like that Babylonian map. And they, these are called T and O maps. And the T is, you see how the, the center is, is literally a T that is uh, separating the three known continents at the time, Asia, Europe, and Africa. And so that, that is a common theme, which we'll see here. Very famous map, the Mappa Mundi. So forward another uh, to the what, 700 years to the 14th century. And another TO style map. This is huge. This is a four by five foot piece of vellum, which is calfskin uh, with ink, depicting the history, geography, and destiny of humanity as it was understood in Christian Europe. And there are over a thousand inscriptions on this, on this map and all sorts of fantastical beasts. But the ocean is around the outside in a circle. So this is kind of a modified TO map. Maps as we know them today though, started coming back up, up in about the seven, uh, 18th century, 1700s. And we can thank the Cassini family, uh, Cesar Francois and Jean Dominique, they used new tools and science and mathematics using theodolites, triangulation and trigonometry and new binocular lenses to map Europe. Uh, France basically was what they really worked on. Look at the detail in their maps, very accurate. They used longitude and latitude and contours, um, putting in place names, rivers, and that looks like maps as we know them today. And maps in the field, so not much later than this, uh, we, this age of discovery, and we have, this is a great example of the importance of mapping in our journals, the journals of um, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Uh, Lewis uh, was, I think that's his journal there. Uh, they extensively mapped, of course, the, the route they took the Missouri across uh, North America. And it was unknown until then. So extremely important. And they were very, very accurate, very interesting. All right. So it was just a really super quick history of maps because what we're doing is, you know, we're calling forth all this history of humans wanting to document what we see on some way that is memorialized. So in our case, it's our journals, our field notebooks. And today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, four different types of maps. I've just pulled these out. These are great ways to represent data and landscapes in your journals. So the first one we'll look at are traditional maps. And that's where you would add feature contours, features like mountains, trees, showing relief, et cetera. There's lots of different ways to do it. This is from Kim McNett, who does wonderful maps. Another fun way to add really great maps in a, a, a compact way and some really creative ways. It's actually a very old style called itinerary maps or strip maps, they're called in uh, Australia and England. Um, this one is from the 13th century and it's literally a route and it's, it's followed up and down the paper. Like you start at the bottom left, you go up to the top, then you take a right turn and you go down the center strip and then take a left turn and go up the, the top strip and, and you're literally following, following landmarks. And so I'll show you how some fun ways we can incorporate that. Then a little bit more uh, illustrative are picture highlight maps. So depicting a place or a region with, with a lot of pictures instead of more topography. We'll be looking at these, um, I'm just going over the highlights. Uh, then behavior and data maps. So it's not just always place, you might be mapping behavior or birdsong or flower blooms. Right now I'm going to get more in depth on these and talk about elements. 
So this map, as I said earlier, is by Kim McNutt. And just take a look at this for a, a moment. It's, it's quite, it's, it's just ink. And yet it's incredibly compelling and fun. Look at her little, um, little bits. If you look at it for a while, you'll see, yes, it's got accurate placement of towns like Kenai, Homer, um, Bays, Kachemak Bay, the ice fields, the mountains, but also the, <laughs> the, the sea dragon and there's the north wind blowing up there. So you can have a lot of fun with these. And the, the handouts that I sent you with the, the different cartographic elements, you would use these in a map like this. What, how to depict mountains versus hills versus representations. These are symbols. You're not trying to draw the exact Kenai Mountains, of course. You're just putting in here representations. But this is a great way to do it. Let's look at some other ways to do this. Now, uh, the map on the left, uh, if we can, folks, if you can check your mute, I think we've got someone who has, isn't muted. If you could make sure you're muted, please. I'm getting a little feedback. Um, the map on the left is from the field notes of the journalist Clifford Alexander, who wrote a book about the, the war in uh, World War II in the North Africa campaigns. And I really liked his map. This is a very simple map, but it's pretty elegant and it's got all the correct uh, components that you want to have for a map. Uh, the map on the right is a much more, that's a map I drew of Tumamak Hill in Tucson. And that is a much more art, artistic, but also accurate contour map. I really wanted to study the contours of the mountains. So I was actually uh, doing this from a topographic map, but it's another way you can copy information into your journal and really get to know and study a landscape and understanding what those, the contour lines and everything mean. And we'll be going over that. Uh, but if you look at, for example, a circle with the, all the lines going outward, that is representing you know, the top of a, of a hill and everything else going down from there. So you get a real sense that that's kind of got relief. And of course it's got the um, elevation lines uh, and we'll, I'll show you those in just a moment. Here's Kim McNett again. And this is another way to do a, a traditional style of map, but with a little more information. She does pullouts and a lot of good information. In fact, you have to really study this map for a long time. What this is, is a map of glaciers in the bay. And she has drawn, put numbers and indicated, those are names of, of glaciers. And then she drew side views of what the, I, I said glaciers, I meant icebergs, excuse me. Um, icebergs um, frozen in the lake. So she drew, you know, where they were kind of stuck on the, 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 the shore and uh, what, what they look like underneath. You, you've got the name of it. One of them's called Growler. One of them's called Bitsy, Ber Berzyberg. Another one, or Bergybit, Bergybit, that's it. Um, the Ice Castle. So very cool way to map what she's seeing in the landscape. These are the features and elements I was talking about. Let's look at those. These are the handouts that I, I gave you. These are great to just keep as a reference because what you want to do when you're doing a slightly more traditional maps is you want to represent something. You don't want to draw it exactly. We're not, we're not trying to make a photographic copy of a place. You want to represent what is there. So those are good ways to represent mountains versus hills. You can see the difference. Hills are a little more roundy. I haven't put in quite as much strong emphasis on slope. Dunes are going to be even more uh, rounded, smaller. Uh, someone mentioned that you know a mesa is the same thing as a butte. We call them mesas out west. That is uh, Spanish for table. 
and how you would represent them. Uh, these are things you just want to practice and, uh, and, and draw and get used to, to doing if you're in an area that's going to have these types of landforms. But again, I'm not doing an exact copy. I'm representing what these forms look like. Canyons, um, same, you, you would draw your parallel lines with the, the squiggles showing the, um, the edges of the canyons. And then you show the depth by putting the straight lines down from the uh, edge of the canyon. And I'll show you that when I do a demo. And then different types of landscapes. So if you're seeing grassland versus mixed terrain versus desert, you come up with ways that work well for representing what that looks like. Conifer forests look a little, little different than broadleaf forests, so I might draw those a little differently. Oh, yeah, is someone talking? Okay, make sure you're muted, please, um, unless, unless you need to let me know something. Okay, great, thank you. All right, and then a meadow is represented, uh, say, with trees around the edge and then little bits of grass. So your eye will, will recognize, oh, well, yeah, that's a meadow or a coastline. Uh, little dots to show sand uh, and the wavy squiggles to show water movement, you know, the waves uh, to differentiate that from the earth. So you can do marshes, river deltas, and then other elements you'll probably end up wanting to put in would be figure out ways to differentiate between a main road, which maybe are you know, solid lines, you might even color it in with darker color if it's tarmac, if it's paved, versus a two-track dirt road that, that just you know, has the two, two tracks of tire tracks versus a walking trail. So you wanna differentiate those. And the cartographic elements that you want to always include would be scale. So indicate somewhere a length of something. You can either do a scale or you can point to something on the map and say, you know, this is a mile long here, or this is 50 feet or something like that. You wanna have a compass rose or north arrow because you wanna show your, your, uh, your viewers, which is it you or someone you're sharing this with, which way is north, so you're oriented. Then you want a legend, so you come up with your own uh, ways of representing things, make a little legend, this is, you know, this is a uh, grassland, this is desert, this is um, what, you know, the for this indicates forest, things like that. A uh, dotted line for a walking trail, do a little two track if, if you've got a two track in your map. So a legend is really important for these types of maps. Then if you're going to get a little more serious and you do have this information, so you're looking this up on established maps because we're not, we're not, um, we're not setting, uh, we're not out shooting with, with laser uh, uh, measuring devices or anything to do our own mapping, but, but we would maybe look up and see what our contour is. Where, where are we? What elevation are we at? If you know you're at the edge of the Yellowstone River and it's you know 1,800 meters there, then you can put that in your map. Uh, then those are the other elements that I was explaining a little earlier, just so you can see how you make things look like they're raised versus depressed. So a hilltop, you would have your top of the hill and then the lines pointing radiating out and run your circle lines around that and more lines radiating out to show that that is a hilltop. And then do the opposite, say if it's a depression, say it's, a, say it's an empty lake bed or, or a, a, some sort of um, a sink or a glacial scrape, then you would do the opposite. You show your lines pointing inward until you get to the bottom. And that visually represents a depression versus a hill. All right, moving on. So we wanna have plenty of time to do some sketching. Um, these are fun, these linear and strip maps. Here's another example. This is a really famous one from the first atlas called the Britannia Atlas by John Ogilvy, who was a fascinating um, autodidact. Uh, he was an extremely uh, 
man, he did everything. He was an actor. He was a playwright. He uh, learned to make books. He learned to draw maps. He was he was a pretty pretty amazing. Look him up. Um, but this map, you start at the bottom left. So go to the far left strip. Start at the bottom. You go. This is how you use the map. You travel north. This is how to get from London to Bury St Edmunds, I think. And you know you follow all the the directions and it even says you know this is you know, two days travel I assume that's on a horse or by foot I don't know it would probably say I can't read it and then you 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 turn and go down the next strip and then up the next strip and down the next so here are ways that I've used this in 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 my uh overlanding and and journals that I use when I'm traveling extensively we were exploring the uh Victoria Desert in Australia, in Western Australia. And as you can see on the side of my journal page there, I drew a strip map and that was our route for that day. And I added elements on that map as I went along. And those, I, I described those elements more in the prose of my field notebook. And the next day, August 17th, you can see the map continues, but I made this one go sideways. Let me show you what that looks like. Let's see. There. Um, you can see how, how that goes. So we traveled north and then got on the Great Central Road, but then we took a left and continued going north up another road. And that shows our route. Those were unnamed roads at that point, just four-wheel drive tracks in the back country of Australia. And that really gave me a great record of a really, really neat exploration and a lot of data. So, you know, dingoes howling there. Um, there was our camp. It was a desert oak forest. There were dunes there. There was a dead camel there. You know, there's just lots of fun things like that. Fun. Well, the dead camel wasn't fun, but it was interesting. Here's another idea for doing a strip map is to cut these out ahead of time and keep them in your, your field kit. Uh, cut some strips out of sturdy paper. This is watercolor paper. And you can then glue it in and the, the map would accordion up and stick into your journal. This is what it looks like. So here's the same route I did a uh, little bit more detailed because it's a little bit bigger. So it lets me get more detail in there. And I could actually turn it over and do the other side maybe if I wanted. I could also run it sideways so I could actually glue that piece in and then the map would go to the right all the way out and then it would accordion back in when I closed the journal. That's a really fun way to do it. You can also keep them separate. I keep little plastic when it, whenever you get something that's covered in plastic, little sheath or something or a little envelope, keep those in your kit. You can glue them in your field notebook to tuck things in like this. I'm really, really loving these strip maps. They, they are very, very versatile. You can also buy these great little things called zigzag books. Um, this is from arttoolkit.com. It's just a tiny little pre-made book. Uh, I think they're about $8. And you can keep this in your field bag and then do a map on these. All right, then the other kind of map, I call these picture highlight maps which are really fun to do, far less about extreme detail of the landscape, but more about highlights that are just something interesting that you saw. So this is Tohono Chul, a uh, botanical garden in North uh, West Tucson. And I drew the, the walking trails. It's not super accurate. I, I, I think I probably missed a few things, but I had a lot of fun kind of walking the trails and drawing these in and then drawing the highlights from each area that I saw. Like there was quail running across here. There was this amazing old saguaro that was missing its top, but it had like five, like 15 arms still and zillions of holes in it. I have no idea how it was still alive. I drew a hummingbird, a couple of the buildings. And that's just a really great way to add interest to your, your field notes. And then they're very fun and pretty quick to do. 
Here's an example. This is um, Anton Thomas. If you don't know who he is, he's this amazing young man. It took him, I don't know, I think he said six or seven years to do this gigantic map of North America. And he filled in every region. Here, I, I zoomed in on the the Arizona, the Southern Arizona region. You can see how he did the pictures. He's not doing exact representations. This isn't a, a contour map by USGS, but this is a fun pictorial map. And he did add some, some things that call to mind uh, specific places. For example, the Chiricahua National Monument in Southeastern Arizona, he shows all the rock spires. The crossed pistols is Tombstone, Arizona, of course. And just, he had a lot of fun with that. So that is another way to do it. This would take a long time, but it would be a lot of fun to do. Dana Ross uh, does these wonderful pictorial maps. I zoomed in a little bit here on her map. So you can take a look at how she represented things using pictures rather than a lot of topographical features. So where the traditional maps have more of the topographical features, these have picture features. So she came up with ways to symbolize uh, the different places with maybe specific buildings or little known house or the, the different bays and things. And this is a very attractive, fairly easy to do map and a great way to represent a place. Uh, Pat Cuny who might be here today. So thank you, Pat, for, for letting me use this because I loved this idea. So this is another way to do a pictorial map, but don't even worry about trying to get the exact, like you don't have time to draw the, the she went, a, they went a pretty big distance here and this was a great way to do it. She did three legs of the trip, what the different hours and distances were, and then the details of what happened at each, stop and a little picture at each stop. So Sequoia National Forest, this is Sequoia. Then home, which I thought was really great, Morro Bay. And then her notes give you an idea of everything that happened during this road trip. Wonderful way to do it, very low stress, but pictorial gave a lot of information about what she did, where they went uh, in a very clear way. Great metadata in the center, the center there. Really love that. Uh, Colby Kirk, as uh, he hiked, did this 100 Hikes project, and I'm hoping he, he was working with Heyday Books, and I'm hoping they're going to come out with this um, as a book, but he has dozens and dozens of these little journals. These are, that's actually a Moleskine journal, so those are little. That's, those journals are like three and a half by five, I think. And so he does these beautiful maps and representations. This isn't exactly a map, but it kind of is. He's, he's drawn a representation of the, the coastline and then zoomed in twice to show uh, the details and the top of the, the coastal cliff there. That's a, the vegetation mapping that he did up there was really cool. So another way to do your, your pictorial type maps. And then this one is really creative and uh, much less about exact place, but this was a more of a, a representation of someone's home. Maureen, let me use this, I loved it. So in the center is her home, <laughs> says me, her kitty, her plant in one square. And then the next square is her town, which she represents with um, the, the pine trees that's representative of her, her locale, the raven, or yeah, that's a raven. And then the next, the more wilderness and the river and the, the mountains surrounding her location in British Columbia. So not exactly a map map, but let's just remember there are different ways to visualize what we do and see in our journals. All right, and finally, the, the, I really enjoy doing these behavior and data maps. And so this is a good example of, I was at my studio at the Desert Laboratory on Tumamock Hill and stepping out for a break, I noticed a Costas hummingbird was zipping around in the desert outside the studio. 
And I could have just observed and sketched the, the hummingbird. I could have just done a, a drawing of a hummingbird. But then I realized it's more interesting. What was he doing? I observed him for a while. And then I decided to map what he was doing. Perch A, perch B, perch C, and then represented what was a kind of a tree. Was he in an Ocotillo? Was he in a Palo Verde tree? Uh, and then how far apart were they? So he kept going around and around this area, zipping from perch to perch. And then I made a little context there that as he sat on his perch, he would like, look, 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 swivel, swivel. So this is a way to represent behavior on a map. And it made me ask some questions. Well, I didn't really didn't know how big a Costa's hummingbird territory is. I need to look that up. Here's another fun one. So this is my backyard. And I observed a baby bunny, what I call spaz out, doing its spaz out thing. Like it was just sitting there at one point and then it just took off and it ran around the ironwood tree, across the yard, around another planting area and stopped. And then it zig, zig, zigged, boinged straight up in the air, came down in a new direction, made a U-turn, zagged, and then sat there like, started grooming like nothing had happened. I could have written that down, but it was more interesting and fun. And it shows some interesting behavior um, to map it. And it also made me think, huh, is that play? Or is he practicing predator evasion? Or is he just spazzing out? I don't know. But baby bunnies do this. I just observed one yesterday doing it. And Kim McNett also let me use this one. So this is another way when you're observing wildlife in an area to map them on the place. And she used a legend Black bears are marked with a, a black dot. Geese are a brown dot. Ducks, blue. Yellow legs are, are a purple dot and so on. River otters are a red dot. You can follow that. And then she placed them on the landscape and then some of their movements. Uh, and even if it was an individual animal, uh, if there were more than one, so it looks like there were four to seven black bears. Um, Kim's in Alaska, if you haven't guessed, um, what their movements were. So... Another way to visualize nature data in a map. She could have written this all down, but this packs information into a visual smorgasbord that is just fabulous to look at. So you can see her camp and the more you look, you're just like, wow, look at all that. What she observed over this, during the time of her trip to um, Saline Lagoon in Point Graham, Alaska. Very cool. Uh, here's another way to represent data in a map. And in this case, this is bird song. And the map is actually uh, frequency and like throughout the day. So the bottom I mapped, so that, that's the 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., all the way through from sunrise to sunset. And then the Rectangles are, those are bird names. So that, those are American Ornithological Union bird, bird uh, nomenclature for the uh, name of a bird. So Luwa is Lucy's warbler. WWDO is white-winged dove. Uh, let's see, you know, uh, NOFL is northern flicker and so on. And so every hour on the hour, I went out and spent 10 minutes observing and writing down all the different bird songs. And then I mapped them based on also frequency. So like really low frequency, like the doves and like really high fre frequency, the Abert's toeys at the top and then everything in between. So visually now you can see my day from dawn to dusk and what birds were singing when and what they were doing. So that is a way to map nature data. Um, here, the Curious Finches, um, I just forgot her first name. <laughs> Sorry about that. She mapped bird song for a period of time based on the sound. Was it soft and distinct, low and mid-range, medium and close range, or really close range and loud? 
And so you're just looking out and visualizing these songs across the landscape and what they were. And when she could identify them, she wrote in the identity, but mostly she would just write, um, you know, like ank, 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 or rack, whack, rack, or chitty, 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 tip, tip, tip. That's a really great, you can almost hear everything on that map. I really love that. Really fun. Uh, Dennis Nord on um, the Nature Journal Club, he mapped the oak blooms in his neighborhood. And that's a traditional map. And then the circles are the different uh, trees and how many blooms um, that he counted on them, which is really crazy. I uh, love this. This was a great nature study, but it is a map showing data, nature data. You can also do celestial maps. Um, this is tracking, this was a project uh, John Muir Lies has been doing for a couple of years now, tracking the summer solstice. So you go out at dawn and you at different times, like I think every hour we tried to do them, um, 7.39, every two hours is what I did. Um, you go up and you use trigonometry and you use a compass and you measure the, the height of the sun and you map it using degrees of uh, along, along the latitude and then also in the sky. So very interesting. You can actually see the arc of the sun and that's a 360 degree view. Very fun way to do mapping. You can do this with stars too. All right, before we jump into actually drawing, then let's, make sure we, we go over some important components. You wanna to try to put in most of your maps, scale, legend, and context. So try to put in scale. So I did that in this map through measurement, so 40 feet. So you got an idea that, that what that landscape that I drew there is. The legend is, you know, what are those marks that I made? Don't just, don't just make the marks without writing what they are. And you might forget, so you want to do a legend. Ocotillo, Palo Verde, the saguaro, the top of a cactus, because I'm looking straight down. Then the context, you know, write a bit, you know, what is it doing? You know, I was, I was mapping the, the, what I think might be a Costa's hummingbird territory. So let's look at another one on Kim's. So her legend is, you know, what are those numbers on the frozen lake? then those numbers correspond to the name of the icebergs. And then the context is, is she wrote more about what we were looking at and then her scale. So how tall, what are we looking at there? So in this case, the scale for her was um, how, there's two, there's one is how high, how tall, and then the other is their actual height and length. So. Very, very well done. And then here's the, uh, the context legend and scale for that bird song chart. So I wrote quite a bit about that. I gave it the context, a lot of questions, did a lot of research. And then I wrote my, my legend, what the colors mean, what the, um, the, the nomenclature is for the American Ornithology Ornithological Union. They're called alpha codes, I forgot that, and so forth. All right, well, it's time to go have fun. But first I'm gonna check all these chats because there's a lot. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna see if there's anything that is a specific question. There's a lot of comments. So if I miss a question, it's hard for me to find the exact questions, all right? Um, Excuse me, Roseanne. Yes, perfect. It's much easier to do it verbally. No, that's okay. I just wanted to point out that most of the questions have been answered. People have been chiming in to help answer questions about links to the handouts and that sort of thing. So perfect. Um, I think we're pretty well caught up on that. Thank you so much. Um, yes, when people join a meeting late, the chat is empty. Uh, chat only starts for someone once they come on. So yes, so it's easy to miss the, the links if you came on a little bit later. And then there's a lot in there too. So thank you so much. And I think, great. Um, 
Wonderful. Okay. I think what we're going to do next, I want to show you a video of Yellowstone. It's just, it's just short. It's like five minutes. And the reason is so we're going to, the, it's called the Northern Ranges in Yellowstone. And it's, it's known as the Serengeti of North America. And you'll find out why. It's a pretty incredible place. But we're going to map there. So I want you to understand a little bit more context, right? So instead of just I thought at first we might just like make up some maps, but no, I, th I think we're gonna map an actual place. And, and that way you'll see how we choose what to draw and how to do it in different ways. So I'm going to play, um, let me make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna play this video. And once I launch it, I'll ask um, Valerie, you can maybe come on and just verbally tell me, you know, yeah, it's we're looking at it and then I'll set play. And okay. hopefully let me set up my mic so that it, it works. Since I my main computer bit the dust, um, I'm hoping this will work well here. So the mic is, is going to be aimed at the video. I'm having to do it differently than I had planned. So let me see. Um, all right, I'm going to share. The Northern Range is the hub of wildlife in Yellowstone. So much of the wildlife in Yellowstone lives here. It's 10% of the area of the park, yet half the wolves live here. It's arguably the most carnivore rich area in North America, and it's been studied a lot. The Northern Range has been referred to as the Serengeti of North America, and that's because of the vast numbers of ungulate species, mostly. And so when people look out, they may, in one afternoon, in the valley bottom of a Northern Range valley, they may see bison, elk, pronghorn, mule deer, wolves and bears, and all of these species interacting with each other. Well, the Northern Range is the northern area of the park where the Northern Yellowstone elk herd spends the winter. So it's winter range for the biggest elk herd in the park. And it's probably the densest year-round wolf population at any location in North America. We roughly have uh, 35 to 40 wolves uh, year round in the park portion of the Northern Range. But we've been as dense as a hundred wolves just in the Northern part of Yellowstone. And we have pretty high bear densities and cougar densities as well. So we have a great mix of carnivore species and we have high density. You know, 50 years ago, that was not the case. We came into the Northern Range as Yellowstone was designated a park and changed a lot of things. So wolves, coyotes, mountain lions, bears to some degree were all being removed in vast numbers. Wolves were eliminated by people directly in the early part of the 20th century. So what happens when you kill off the predators? Well, the prey increases to very high levels and starts to impact the environment. And by doing that, the elk herd shot up and no one really knows how high they shot up. 20, 30,000 was the estimated figure. And they were degrading the environment. Our policy on helping restore nature is fairly clear. If humans did it, we'll help the system get back on the right track. So what was missing were all these carnivores. And so they were not performing their ecological function. Cougars came back to Yellowstone on their own through natural dispersal. We started seeing signs of that in the 80s, and we reintroduced wolves in the mid-90s. And now that wolves and cougars have been restored and bears have increased, the new story is about what happened to all the elk and what is happening to the willow and aspen now that the elk have declined and these carnivores are back. 
The willow is relied on by a lot of animals, and so it's kind of a positive feedback loop. The more willows there are, the more moose and beaver, and the healthier the ecosystem because of those animals being involved too. And so beavers are, of course, nature's engineers, and they'll build lodges and dams that will help raise the water tables. And raising the water table is one of the things that the willows rely on the most. They can't deal with cut banks and swiftly moving creeks. They have to have that slow moving water. So the smaller elk herd is more natural. We're seeing a response of willow and aspen, which used to be suppressed. We've got wolves and cougars back. We've got more bears. So Yellowstone system now is a National Park Service success story. I think the Northern Range is incredibly unique, not only for the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but for the world. Protecting Yellowstone is important to just protect the species that live here, but also provide people a place to be able to see natural processes and use that throughout their life for making decisions on what they think is important. I think a huge value of the national parks is to instill awe of nature into people. Going out on a landscape filled with grizzly bears is not the same as, you know, going to the mall. And seeing wolves bring down an elk or seeing two wolf packs clash right in front of you are life altering events. There's no question we are changing people's lives by having places like Yellowstone. And the Northern Range is probably the heart of the park, and the park's the heart of the ecosystem. So it's all built upon each other, but at ground zero is the Northern Range. Okay, well that was that was fun. I really wanted to share that because I wanted to emphasize that mapping is also about context. So we need to understand the place that we're going to. So since this is kind of a, a bit of a, a virtual field trip in a sense, uh, so we can demonstrate mapping. Um, let's see. I'm looking at, make sure there's no questions. Um, all right, before I, before I drop in, any specific questions about the maps, the skills, things? We're going to start with a traditional map. I'm going to take you back to Yellowstone and show you a screen, uh, take you there with, with a 360-degree view. Okay. All right. Now, get everything set up here. Let's go back to Yellowstone. Much. All right, let's let's take a look at what this, where we're at. I'm going to zoom out for a minute. Well, it's a little slow, but I wanted you to see where we're at. This is the Northern Range. We're at the junction of the Lamar and Yellowstone Rivers. We're actually looking east. North is to the left. So if you if you look down here, that is the, the north arrow, the red is pointing north and you can see Billings, Montana up to the left and we're looking into Wyoming and the Dakotas to the, to the right, okay? So let's go back, zoom in. So I'm confused which way is north? This should be up, right? Nope, the way that I have the map oriented because, um, so we're on a field trip and we're overlooking the Lamar, um, the Lamar River there goes, goes up and that's the Yellowstone River going from left to right. North is to, you can put north anywhere you want, but, but so we're in the field, right? So I wanted to draw this specific uh, view because we're going to use it to demonstrate a number of different maps. So north is 
to the left side of this particular scene. So when you're when we do our map, we will put the north arrow pointing to the left. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, you're it, welcome. No. It does, it does throw me because I'm so used to north being up. <laughs> yeah. So we're pretending we're on a field trip. So let's we're 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 standing in a on a cliff or or in a balloon looking at this and. We want to sketch it in our notebooks um, to memorialize it. So, right now we're seeing it, not turning our orientation to the north. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Okay, awesome. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to now call up. Give me just a second here. I'm, I've got this image here. I've actually memorialized it with a screen capture. And now I'm gonna turn on my camera so that you can see my document camera. Um, and you're gonna watch, you'll be able to see me sketch. So hang on just a second. And oops, it's gonna show my face. Oh, there we go, awesome, it came up. Let's give it a moment to... Uh... Uh, there, it's a little bit smaller, but should be able to get the gist of what I'm doing here. Um, now, those of you who've taken my, my classes before and my trips, um, you'll know I always start with the metadata. So I pre-wrote this. Um, I can share this at the end as well, but that's the latitude and longitude of this location here at the confluence of the Yellowstone River and the Lamar River. So I wrote that here. Uh, it's 1849 meters. I'd have to uh, multiply that out to get to feet. Um, and of course the sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moonset, what the moon phase is. The weather's partly cloudy. It was 36 degrees this morning and the high is 55. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to show how I would do a more traditional map map with the topographic features. Now, again, we're not trying to do an exact, I'm not drawing a landscape here. I'm, I'm mapping it using symbols. So I'm gonna use pencil because mapping's not easy and I wanna get my proportions right. I, if I'm sketching something, doing like a quick sketch, I, I, I usually go straight to pen, but in this case, I'm gonna do pencil because it lets me play with features. Um, Roseanne? Yeah. Um, your sound bar is showing. Oh, on thank your you. Screen. Yeah, I forgot to move my my mouse. That thank you. Do it. Let me make. Let me go away. Should go away in just a second. No. I'm trying to remember how I make it go away. Okay, give me two seconds here. Um, it's not cooperating with me today. It usually just disappears if I move the mouse away. Are you, Roseanne, are you able just to click and drag it out to the bottom left under the other element and just move it off of the page? No, this is in the, um, the camera. Oh yeah, thank you. Who was that? That was excellent. So. Let me just stick it up there. Is that okay? Hopefully it'll go away. I've not had it stick around before, so we'll, we'll get you the metadata later. Um, so where I would do is I, I would start with a, a bounding box. I'm going to, I wanna sketch the confluence of, of where the Yellowstone and the Lamar come together and then back up to those ranges. And remember the, the symbols we used, I'm gonna, gonna show you those. So what I would do is I start at the bottom to make sure I get my, I don't go crazy with the scale. So I'm going to sketch in the Yellowstone quickly here. And I'm not gonna be super, super exact, partly because we don't have a ton of time, you know, but, but this is field sketching. There's a, a road that comes across here. All right, got the, the road and that helps ground me a little bit, literally. Okay, so I've got that. I've got the, the Lamar I wanna get in here. 
and it disappears in here. Again, I'm not being like super exact. There's behind a hill here and then way off here. Okay, so one of the things I wanna make sure I remember to do is show where the, the Lamar goes between these, these hills. So I don't, I wanna put a couple of hills there. Now, remember, I'm not doing an exact, not drawing the landscape here. I'm not painting the landscape. So these are representational hills here. So I'm, I'm using my kind of hill symbols here to... Roseanne, could you make your marks just a little darker? It's really hard to see it on the screen. Okay, I will. And I will also be going over this with pen. I'm just was making sure I got them in the right place before I committed. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and do that. But let me just go through and set a few more and then I'll make them darker as I go. Um, so we've got hills continuing Thank you. here. Um, Again, just representational. And then behind are more mountain mountains. So I'll probably make these a little bigger. I didn't give myself quite enough room. So I'm, I'm, I'm went into my, my writing there. Um, I could erase this and move it down, but I think I'll just leave it for this demonstration so you can see how I would go about doing things. Um, so I took that slice of it. Um, let's get that. There's a butte here, the Junction Butte. The Junction is, is Tower Junction is the name of a place name we'll see in a minute. Um, but let's get that butte place because that's a, a good one. We can practice, remember a, a mesa or a butte. This is going to be, we're gonna draw the, the top of it here lightly and then I'll make it a little darker. And remember this is pencil, I'll be going back over it in pen, but remember that you do your lines to show that this is a butte or a mesa. Like so, and it's kind of, it was flatter on this side and steeper here. And I also see there's a kind of a little cleft canyon here. Over here is a, there's a, a, a little tarn or, or lake here that's got, a couple of hills by it. Not trying to sketch everything here. And this, this little lake has an outflow. And it comes down like that. And then there's some topography here I wanna lightly put in. This is pretty flat in here. I think I'll leave it for now. Um, I can go in and add details now. Let's um, let's make the see. This is this is an oblique view, um, so that's why we're seeing this a little more um, raised up. Get just sketching in the the cut of the Yellowstone here. And this is a cliff here. So I'm doing those straight lines to show this is some topography. Um, same thing here. These, this is a not quite as tall, and there's also some trees in here. So I might do some squiggles for trees.
This is lined with trees here. And I would come in and do this by pen. I'm not gonna do a lot of detail down here, but I do notice that this bank here, there, this, this is a hill here. Coming down. And then this is the, the edge here. And then the Lamar River, to give it a little shape, pretty little river. Oop. Can't see all of it all the time. It's gonna go into the, it's little, it's smaller and smaller as you go back until it's just disappears. Now there's, there's three interesting kind of hills here. I'm going to mark, again, we're doing representational marks. We're not trying to paint here, um, but I wanna show these interesting hills. And these, these have this interesting rock on them, which I will go ahead and mark their tops. like that. And then since this is closer, I might go ahead and, and draw these, a few tree trees here to show this is a little closer. These are probably shrub like willows and things in here. I'm not quite sure, you'd have to zoom in to see. Um, so at this point, to make sure I don't spend too much time on each one. I wanna, I wanna hit on different, all the different ways to, to represent here. So, this is like, I'm, I'm making this have a kind of a cliff side here. So this starts to have more contours. Um, so as, as I have more time, I can go in and, you know, add some shading to give these. Remember when, if you're doing shading to make it look like a mountain, that the shading all needs to be on the same side pretty much unless the shape changes dramatically. So the sun is, is coming from a certain side. Um, and then we can go in and add not quite as many lines here, but to show these are, are kind of hills with, with shape. So, more detail closer to you, less detail as you go away. And your maps take time. It's, it's not something we wanna rush. You also don't want, remember Kim, Kim McNett's um, maps, you don't wanna do a ton of detail, but otherwise you sort of defeat your purpose here. So we would wanna make sure we label things. So this is the Lamar. And this is the Yellowstone. And what else we don't wanna forget? Um, where North is, so I'll just do do it like so. And this is called Junction Butte.
And see my bounding box didn't quite work. That's okay. There. So I could go back, work on this with pen, add some color, make make some of the um, add a little bit of color for the uh, where the trees are, but not overdo it too much. Um, and that'll give us a really great representational kind of traditional map. Um, and we would want to maybe name, you know, Mount Mount Hornaday, Bison Peak, maybe. Um, and here, the this is the the, the Lamar Valley is out here. So I'm gonna move on to the next type of map because I wanna show how we visualize all these different places in different ways. Um, so let's go right now, I'm gonna go back to, all right, are we back to the, can you see the Google Earth again? Yes. Great, thank you. So now let's do, let's do a fun, what I call uh, the pictorial maps. And we're gonna change our view, our, our aspect here. Instead of that oblique view where we got some of the contours and you get that, it's like you're looking from above and down. Now we're going to do a two, like more of a 2D. So we just flipped up. Now we're looking straight down. There, same place, but from straight down. Get a different view here. So we're going to draw a pictorial map now. And what I'm going to do is Now we're going to look at this one. Okay, let me scoot this over so that you can see the, the other page here. So what I do with these, um, this is a lot more kind of whimsical, if you will. Um, so we're gonna have fun. So let's, let's give us a, a, a little bit of a bounding box again. Pardon me, Roseanne. Sure. So in the, the view from overhead, it looks like the road crosses the Yellowstone River. Is that a bridge? Yes, it is. And we're going to draw that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Good spotting. So I made a, a kind of a bounding here. So I, I, if I don't do a bounding box, I tend to just kind of go all over the place. So um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more here. Just a little bit. Ooh, er, er. I think so. Um, just trying to get this oriented to what I want to draw. All right, so we're taking a slice again. And this time what I'm going to do, this is a little bit more of a whimsical version and it's going to be straight down. So, I'm going to take a slice of the river, but I'm also, I want to include the Lamar coming down. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to come up with this kind of bend here. This probably won't be super exact because I'm, it's hard to draw and talk, but you'll get the, the point.
All right, so you're right, this is the road here. So this is, this goes up to Tower Falls here and we can do a little more of a representation of a bridge here by, by actually drawing there. And now our, our road has, has a place to go over. And see this loops around and goes up here. Again, I'm using pencils so I can I can change this if I really mess up. So here's the Lamar. Remember the Lamar is smaller than the than the Yellowstone. And oh, I probably zoomed out a little bit too much here, but there's that little creek coming in that was up from that lake. There's a that lake up here, um, but I don't have enough room for that. And then the junction butte, instead of drawing it straight down, we're gonna do a pictorial. So again, this is, I think I'll, I think I'll kind of end this here. So instead of drawing the butte, I'm, I'm gonna make it a, a pictorial, not a, not the actual butte. So this is a little bit more fun, a little bit more whimsical. Roseanne, um, one question is, if you had not visited here before, and this is a new spot for you, how do you get, how do you draw, how do you draw this map? Ah, good, good point. So when I'm at a place like this, I might, you know, I'll maybe I've done the navigation on my GPS or, you know, with my phone and Google. Um, and then I've, I've got that already. And I will transfer it so very similar to what I'm doing now. I will just go ahead and transfer this into my journal using that, um, that resource. Does that make sense? Let me let me check. That was a question by Anise. Um, so using using you know a, a a like Google Maps on my phone is a great way to do that. Okay, I think that helps clarify it. There we go. So see, I didn't draw. I I drew a butte sticking up rather than from straight down. Now I'm going pictorial, right? So let's, now's the part where we're gonna get a little bit more um, creative because, you know, we're not really there, but let's say we spent the day here hiking around and exploring. I know, uh, I know from the map there that um, here is a parking lot and there's a hiking trail. So remember our legend and our elements. There is a hiking trail that goes from that parking lot here along this, this area here. And um, let's say, you know, we, we went hiking down here, we're brave. Huh? And down here we saw uh, tracks, grizzly bear tracks. So how to represent that? I would draw a track to show this is where I saw a grizzly bear track. And um, I know it was a grizzly bear because they tend to, um, their, their tracks are, are more straight across here on the toe. This is a, a forefoot, front foot. Um, and a black bear track was a lot more rounded. Um, 
and it's got the big claw marks so I can write, you know. Here we saw grizzly tracks. This is how you do pictorial maps. And you know, you'd wanna do label, maybe you change your to a script when you're doing, um, change your font of what you're writing and that, that helps too. Like that. Um, what else can we do that's kind of fun? Okay, so we know this goes up to a place called Tower Falls, um, right out here. It's just off the map, but let's be fun. And um, so let's, let's do a waterfall. Very famous. Tower falls here. So, um, so let's call this two. Tower falls. A little fun, fun, fun thing there. Um, what else? So this area here, let's go ahead and, and make a little makeup. This is sagebrush. So I'm making up a symbol for sagebrush for the landscape. And that just adds a little bit of interest. And I'd, I'd do my legend down here, um, down here. And then let's just pretend we're gonna have fun here. Um, here is a beaver lodge. Oh, there's beavers on the Lamar. So let's... Um, Let's draw a beaver lodge. These are all things you observed during your day. And I mean, you could even have fun and um, draw, draw a little, see if I can draw a beaver. I don't see a lot of them out here in the desert. That sort of looks like a beaver. And then maybe, um, maybe we got lucky and we saw, let's see, maybe um, out here between the butte, um, if you zoom in, it's interesting. If you zoom in on this Google Earth, that landscape is just crisscrossed with animal trails. It's fabulous. So let's say we saw a buffalo um, here. These are just ways um, to, add fun pictorial things to your, and I'm not trying to draw a perfect buffalo here. It's a pictorial. Buffaloes have huge heads. So maybe I would color him in. Um, it's got that buffalo beard going on there. You know, maybe I give that some. So we saw like buffalo times like 100 animals in there. So this is just a way you would do a fun pictorial map. Anything you would observe. Um, could do birds, you could do plants. Um, oh, would you want um, to name this road? I uh, actually don't know where this road goes. I'd have to look, but you know, road, let's just call it. Um, it's the Northeast Entrance Road. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Northeast. Thank you. Perfect. There you go. So 
I think that gives you an idea of how you would have a lot of fun. Now, going back in and adding watercolor to this would be really fun because you can, uh, the other thing I observed while I was there um, is that Junction Butte is actually volcanic and these are volcanic cinders. So this has a dark, um, this is very dark on here. So, you know, when you go in and add watercolor, you can leave the top light, you know, and, you know, maybe add a few trees, um, go back and look at some of those examples and you can see. So here's the difference between these two. You've got, let me slide this over. Oh, why won't this dumb thing go away? Okay. Um, you've got a more pictorial fun from above. Um, you've got, uh, then this one is, is more represent more traditional with, with contours and hills and gives you a sense of the landscape where this, this is a fun picture map. So hopefully that gives you a good idea. This is, there's a lot of parallax here. It's not actually, there we go, um, better on that. All right, how about a different view? Let's try a strip map. How would we do a strip map on this? So I would, probably turn my notebook this way. And I would go back here. Oh, what the heck happened? <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> that was funny. Um, I think so for a strip map, I would be Ooh, this is, this is not happy. Uh, as I said before, I'm using a, um, my backup computer, so it's not quite happy. So what I would do is strip map, um, just to show you how I would do them. I'm gonna do the road um, that goes to Tower Fall with the river running on the upper side. So, I would, so say I'm, I'm getting my, let me, let me uh, get back over here so you can see what I'm doing. Um, okay. All right, so, The way I do the strip maps is it's my itinerary for the day is how I often do it. Let's see, getting this situated so you can see. Might have to make this a little smaller. Nope. Okay, so I'm, I'm literally going, like, I'm gonna mark this out in my journal and I, I, would, I would do this ahead of time at the beginning of the day, if I know I'm going a certain place. And so let's say, let's put the, the river in. I'm, I'm going to, I'm not, uh, don't hold me to like the exact shape of this river this time because I'm, I just want to represent it. I would take more time normally. Um, so this is the Yellowstone. And what I'm going to be doing is I want to show the Tower of Fall area. Oops. Which uh, comes from Tower I think it is. And then the road. Parallels here and then we come down and we've got
And that's our, that's our bridge again. There, and this is Tower Junction. So, I would then the next day, so, or even if we're doing it the same day, I could flip the page and continue this on the next page um, or on this side, sorry, we're going this way. So I, I, would, I would continue it, say, do another strip over here. You would, you would literally follow it around. So a really, really fun way, or I would do my, um, I would do one of these maybe and stick that in my, my journal. And then I would have the map right there. And I could even do both sides like I did here. So you saw the Great Central Road one, but it continues. So there's the rest of it. So you could do that too, um, using the road or a hiking trail as your linear base point. And then what you can do is, um, so like, so this is like that, maybe the very edge of the, of the butte comes down here. I think I didn't quite get that scale right, but um, you, know, you would mark Yellowstone River and then you can have a lot of fun. Um, again, it's kind of like a pictorial map. Maybe you do your, your uh, so this is Tower Fall. Again, you could do your fun waterfall. Tower fall. And um, what is it? This is Devil's Den here. <laughs> I meant to look up what that is. And we can do things on here like you did on the pictorial map. You could add your, your grizzly track. You could add, um, you know, your, maybe your, you saw buffalo down here. You can add your buffalo. Um, You could add, um, maybe you lucked out, maybe you saw um, fleeting through the woods. You saw a wolf running off. one of those gorgeous black Yellowstone wolves. Because this is right near um, the Druid Pack is, Druid Peak is right above this and the Druid Pack's in here. So you can just add all sorts of fun things. Label your river and um, have fun with that. So that's how you would do the same landscape in a different way. Now we have a few more minutes. I'm going to next show a really fun way to do behavior, a behavior map. And I'm going to go back to this, let's see. Nope, I'm gonna do it on here. Here's how I would do a behavior map. I would, the map itself, I would, I would probably use something like that pictorial map, a, a nice flat map to do a behavior map. But this is what I'm gonna do first. I'm going to, what, what is the behavior we want to, to look at? And I used that, um, that, the video, and here's what I did. I went through the video as I was watching it. I wrote down all the species I was seeing, 
and what they were eating, because that was a really interesting thing to me. So I drew a grid. Here's what I would do. So remember the video when it showed all of the, um, the species? So you had black bear and grizzly bear and cougar and wolf and coyote, elk, pronghorn, moose, um, buffalo and beaver. I noticed some interesting feeding behaviors. So I'm making a grid. And I would do this in my, just as I'm doing it in my journal. And maybe yeah, there could be quite a bit more data here. And then I would write in, okay, the species I was observing, black bear, grizzly, cougar, wolf, um, coyote, elk. These are all the animals I was observing on my, during my, my day, right? Pronghorn, moose, need more space. There's a lot of wildlife. Buffalo, beaver, and what they were eating. So so different things I observed, grass, uh, vegetation, unknown. Hmm, I saw an elk being eaten. I saw meat being eaten, unknown. And, you know, I'll just leave this I might observe some other things, maybe berries, right? So then I would give each of these a color coding. Remember what Kim did in her map? So each of these circles is gonna be a color. Okay, then, I can't really, let's see, you know, it'd be fun. So right now I'm going to replay that video or most of it without the sound. And let's look at, you guys help me keep track of the, what we're observing each animal eating. This is a nature data. Um, first I have to find that video. <laughs> Let's see, there it is. All right, I'm going to mute it though and go quickly. So help me keep track, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it out. All right. We've got this bear here, he's eating something, I'm not sure what. Um, pronghorn, we're not seeing feeding behaviors. This is our day and we're observing. There's wolves on the hunt. Oh, there's a grizzly bear eating berries. I'm gonna put a mark there. Oh, that guy, I, I'm gonna say he's eating meat unknown. That was a cougar, marking that. It's a coyote. Don't see him feeding. There's some wolves. Look at that black wolf, beautiful. There's the cougar. Oh, so beautiful. Look how fluffy they are there. Those are pronghorn antelope. Those babies are ready to run already. That's amazing how quickly they run. Okay, and there's buffalo and they're, they're browsing. 
All right. Cast the Kira was really interesting, but we want to get back. Oh, there we go. Buffaloes are eating grass. And unknown meat there. So we have um, our grizzly, unknown meat. And we have wolves, unknown meat. Okay. Multiple. Okay. What else? Oh, Doug, you are interesting, but we wanted more wildlife. Okay. Another beautiful coyote. Okay. Fast forward. Okay, there's an elk. He's pulling up grasses. All right? More elk. It's like five. More elk. Wow. Those are various grasses. This space bugling, which was really quite cool. And we have wolves taking elk. And wolves on the hunt. Uh, we've got willow here. Uh, that's that looks like cottonwood and willow. That's willow. Now we're going to see our what's what's near here. That would be moose. Moose are eating unknown vegetation. I'm not sure what they were eating. Beaver eating grass. I'm going to say unknown vegetation. I wasn't sure exactly what he was eating. Uh, roots, grass, and so on. Fast forward a little bit. Um, just want to make sure we have plenty of time. So one thing I wanted to be sure to catch was this interesting. What you think I, you know, I oh, I missed it. So the was the black bear eating grass. And of course I I can't find it. But if you'll recall, there was the black bear just chowing down on grass hopefully it's it's right up here because i i want to finish up we've just got a bare amount of time here yeah maybe this is it oh buffalo tons of buffalo eating grass There's <laughs> bugling. There he is. He's just tearing up grass there. Okay, we're going to stop this. Now you can see what I did. I tallied up what they were eating. And then what I would do is go back to my pictorial map and maybe, maybe I wouldn't have all the drawings on it, but I would, I would put my circles of where I observed buffalo here, um, grizzly here, maybe another buffalo here, wolves here. And you see how we would do that. Um, you know, maybe uh, more buffalo. So this would be the color of, you know, the buffalo here, um, like maybe, and then you could say how many. You would write how many if it was fewer, like you wouldn't want to do a hundred circles. But that's how you would map the data here using the um, circles. And then you'd have your data. So maybe you know your map would be down here. But since we're sort of running short on time, I didn't want to um, 
I really didn't have time to do a complete map, but you get the picture of how you would map data like that. Really interesting. So stop share. All right. Um, let's go to gallery and feel free to turn on your, your video now. I'm going to turn that off and let's ask questions. Um, go ahead and Okay, do you make a dot for each occurrence of behavior? Yes, I would, unless I had a huge herd of, of buffalo, and then I would estimate the numbers. So for example, but you know, if you, you were lucky enough to witness a, a, a wolf taking down an elk, then that's a you know, single occurrence. Then you wanna know how many wolves. Um, so let's see, is the pictorial map usually bird's eye view? Yeah. I. You could do that any way you want, pectoral. No, you could make that anything you want. It could be oblique, it could be from above, it could be you know, anything you wanted, 3D, flat. Um, what was the C? Do you make a dot three? Yeah, we did that. Would you consider this a behavior map or a behavior chart? It's both. Well, this is more of a tally than a chart. The, um, that was just me keeping track, but, but yeah, so it's both. Um, one's a chart, one's a map. A map is representing that behavior on a spatial plane. Does that make sense? Um, question, Valerie? Well, there was one question earlier on about will the link to this Google map be available? Yes, I'll put all of this on the website so you can go back and play and practice and zoom in and out on your own. Hopefully you'll have better bandwidth um, Mine was kind of tanking there. This computer doesn't, isn't, the processor's not strong. So it was very slow. Um, so Jan says your traditional map was angular, meaning it was oblique, um, so that the scale was larger in the distance. How would you make a scale for a map with, how, oh, good. How do you make a scale for a map with changing scale? Um, that's a really good question. So for that particular map, I would probably indicate the distance, like the distance we're looking at along the Yellowstone at the bottom. And you would want to indicate that it's not, the background's not to scale. Um, so you would indicate the distance. So say we are looking at a two mile stretch of the Yellowstone River. That's as good as you can get on that one. And then as you as you zoom out in the diff distance, no, it's not going to match that. That's a really good point. We're not doing um, cart. We're not doing uh, USGS quality uh, cartographic. Or excuse me, <laughs> uh, uh, contour maps here. So, but that's really important that you mentioned that. Thank you. Um, Deb's asking, what is the publication date of the, 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 the new book will be this summer? I want to say July was going to be June, but the Wild Wonder Conference is sort of taking up a lot of my time. <laughs> um, can I, so Suzanne is asking, can I work on a map of a bison preserve in Colorado? Um, yeah, that, that would be a fantastic one. Um, so have I missed any questions? Because there's a lot of uh, chat things. Um, so just verbally ask them if, if we've missed anything. No, all right, any comment? Do anyone want to share their maps? I'll pin you if you want to hold them up. Okay, Alex, let me um, hold on. I'm going to pin you and then um, if you don't mind speaking so we can hold it up closer. So go ahead and speak, Alex, so it, you pop up. There you go. Oh, uh, just, this is my pictorial map. Not much on it. So hold it, can you hold it closer so we can see it? Awesome. Very nice, I like that. Sweet. Good job. Anyone else, let's see, thank you. Um, let's see, remove pin. Sharon, I can see Sharon, so let me pin. First, so week she pops up. Ooh, look at that. Fantastic. You went straight to Penn. <laughs> Yay. Well done. Let's see. Um, 
I'm going back to my gallery view. I'm kind of having to pop around. Sherry's holding hers up. Let me, um, can you? Hello. 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 I've got two of them here, one there and Fun. So does everyone kind of getting the hang of like how you, like one landscape, how you can do it in, so, in, in a lot of different ways. There's, there's a lot of ways to visualize. Um, who else is wanting to, um, let me change pages here. Anyone else wanting? Um, let me show mine, okay? Give me a second. <laughs> okay, tell me your name. I'll have to find you so I can pin you. Patterson. Oh, Jack. Jack. Oh, you're, you're Jack today. <laughs> well, I'm with, I'm with my mom, me and my mom. I think maybe my mom has been with you before. Okay, awesome. Nice, I like that. Well done. And North, get the North, right? Yay. Thanks, Jack. That's fantastic. Okay. Roseanne, I'll share. Debbie Lynn Smith. Okay, let me unpin Jack. Hold on. Debbie, Debbie. Ah, oh, there you are. Add pin. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead and hold yours up. Oh, you're. Uh, Am I not on? Your video? video is not working. Let's see. Uh, uh oh. Try now. Okay, there we go. There we go. Thanks. Hold on. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> How's I that? that? You were fast with the colors. Well done. I like that. Nice. That's that chart. And then I did this one. A little, little rusty, but. Yeah, I'm fast. I mean, I would normally spend quite a bit of time. So. There we go. That's better. Oh, I like that. See how this works? This is fun and everyone's going to have a different way of visualizing. Thank you. What I wanted to emphasize, those are great, is, is that everybody sees things a different way and every way is cool and good and fun. So, um, uh-oh, so the pinning's not working? Hmm. I to talk. Yes, you have to talk. Um, I'll try spotlighting. Maybe that will work better. So, like, I don't know if you can see me if I'm speaking. Okay. Can see me? Is it see Angela? You. Is that Angela? No, oh. Celia. All right, see, I've, I've got, there's 137 people. I'm having trouble. <laughs> okay, so um, who was just speaking? No, I lost you. So I've got Angela was holding hers up. Let me try some yes, spotlight. That's Let me, me. Try spotlight. Okay, how's okay. that better? Now can you all see? Yeah. Um, I've not done any of this before and I've only just started doing nature journaling. So I'm actually quite impressed with what I've done. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Well done. Are you liking maps then? Oh, I love maps. I could take a I could take an ordnance survey map to bed and just read it at night. <laughs> Excellent. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going back to the gallery now. Okay, now who is speaking? I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't find you before. Um I think if you speak it'll pop up now because I've unpinned. So if you speak, I can find you. Celia, was it you? Yeah, let me know. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can pop up. There we go. Yay. So quick. Oh, fun. The different perspectives, and I found that so helpful. And just, um, it, was, it was fun. Well done. Oh, I like that. I love that. So I would, you know. Well done. I really like the different. I love how everyone has a different take on it and everything is great. I'd love it if you all would, you know, take a photo of your pages and send them to me. I'll put them on the website where the tutorial is going to be. That would be fun. Okay, great. Well, thanks for the great workshop. That was so much fun and it motivates me to want to do it with areas that I'm familiar with. Exactly. The challenge was I, I do not know this at all, area at all, but I, but your, you know, your your instruction and and the examples you gave were enough for me to not it's, be too. Yeah, it's just just how to get started. I mean, this is you can spend a lifetime learning cartography. Though this wasn't a, you know, how to make an ordnance survey map. 
but it's how to make maps that work well in, in nature journals, especially field notebooks um, that, that work and have fun. And it's a great exercise too, to get over the fear of making marks in your, your notebooks. Exploring overland.com forward slash field arts with an S. And there's a tutorials page there and I'll email you as well. And thank you so much for coming. And I'll, I'll probably send a, a feedback form too. So, and uh, send me examples. I'd love to put them on the website. I'd love to share that. Thank you all so much. Oh, someone's heading, heading to Yellowstone. Yay. I want to go and, and, and try to see the wolves there. Have never seen the wolves there. So that's a big on my list. Great, thank you. You're, thank you everybody for coming and have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you, it was an excellent morning. Okay, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you. you. All right, that was wonderful.